Welcome everybody uh, to our Ontario Network of CAPC CPMP Projects uh, webinar series. And I'm really just delighted to have you all here with us. Uh, today is uh, Friday, November 6th, um, uh, 2020. And I'm really excited to introduce our presenter to you and uh, to begin our, our time together today. Um, but before we, we do begin, I would invite us all to just pause for a moment and uh, take a moment to consider and, and connect with the land. Um, it's really a, an opportunity to think about our, our relationship with the um, understanding of the history of the land where, where we live and reside. And as a network, we're, we're spread out all across the province. And our Ontario network of CAP CNC PNC projects um, acknowledges and offers gratitude to the Indigenous and First Peoples for sharing this land. And we are grateful to be able to, to serve all vulnerable families all across Ontario. The land where I am coming to you from is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Shabi and neutral peoples. And, um, and so I just, you know, invite us to take that moment to pause and consider. And I think it's a really good opportunity to kind of bring ourselves inward and prepare ourselves for, for learning together. So um, thank you for that. And um, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Nicole Tuzzi, who is the Training and Education Manager, I hope I've got that right, for um, Infant Mental Health Promotion at the Hospital for Sick Children. And um, Nicole will, um, I'm sure, introduce herself a, a little bit more. And um, I think that's with everything I will hand over to you, Nicole. And remember, I'm, I'm here if you have any questions or concerns, and, and I'll let you know if any questions come up. Yes, please do. Thank you. Um, so good morning and welcome, everyone. It's certainly a pleasure to be here and to share with you uh, a model that uh, Infant Mental Health Promotion and our partners have been working on for, for nearly three years now. And in, it's it's it had been done with the hope that, um, you know, we're supporting the needs for individuals who are trained uh, and have an arsenal of knowledge and skills uh, to effectively work with children and their families from age zero to, to six. So again, my name is Nicole Tuzzi. I'm our program manager at IMP, also in charge of all of our training and our education. And my role is mostly around organizing and facilitating training and workshops to support uh, awareness, um, as well as the embedding of infant mental health in one's practice. I'm certainly privileged to work with a variety of sectors that work with children and families, and this morning uh, is absolutely no different. So, I, um, as you know, as much as people thank me coming on, uh, I certainly thank you, you as a group for taking the time to to hear me, um, and and all that we have to to discuss. So. Um, a little bit more about where I came from. I have an early childhood education background, uh, working in various childcare and early learning settings. Uh, and then I certainly moved on in my career to operate a childcare center within an accredited children's mental health agency um, uh, before I came to IMP. So I've been here about a year and a half and my how, how has time has flown, particularly uh, the bulk of my time being with IMP um, during this this really odd pandemic but uh, now more than ever we're seeing the importance of infant mental health and how it impacts families uh, and i think the pandemic has really highlighted uh, the importance of these years the challenges that come uh, for families when they don't have access to to resources uh, for these early years but also the challenges that come for the sector or the various sectors and the system. Uh, and I'm sure most of you are, are well versed in, in how families ha often have challenges in accessing the things that they need in order to be well uh, and to support their child being well uh, in addition to that. So we, today we're talking a little bit of this competency model that we've developed to help support an understanding of where knowledge and skills need to come from in order to support families um, the, the families that we're, we're working with. 
All right, so let's see if these slides will move over for me. There we go. So let's talk a little bit about our history with competencies. IMP has actually come up with, uh, and this was done some years ago, uh, around some core competencies uh, that guide the work that we do with children uh, and their families. But we had had these, you know, created many, many years ago, but not much was done with them. They were merely seen as a suggestion, you know, not even seen as best practice, really, and were largely unused by anyone outside of kind of our tight-knit circle uh, in the early days of IMP. And so as we became more aware of the science behind infant mental health and the multitude of needs of children and families, we knew we needed to kind of turn these suggestions into something far more concrete and meaningful. But we had some barriers that we needed to address and understand more in order to actually do this. So IMP in general, or, and, and by imp, I mean infant mental health in general, especially in Canada, was not seen as really its own scope of practice. And anyone here could call themselves uh, an infant mental health specialist or practitioner. And yet, there's no governing body really or widely used programs that can really identify themselves as such. You know, we are merely infant mental health informed to a degree. So we had no clear vision as to how these competencies could or, or should be used, and certainly not about who should be using them, uh, especially since there was nothing in place to really enforce these guidelines about how people came to their work with children and families. And so we can even see within the sectors that you would assume would have knowledge around these competencies. And I kind of look to children's treatment centers or even in primary care, our family physicians. Um, it's not work that they were really providing service for or recognizing in their own interactions with families. So we often see in our children's treatment centers or our child and youth mental health centers, uh, with some exceptions, of course, really not looking at how they're working with the under four population in particular. You know, we really only start to care once kids are kind of going into formal schooling. But I think we have to acknowledge that over the last several years, things have started to change. There is some growing awareness around um, what it means to have mental health when you are under the age of five in particular. So even in the last EDI report, which is the early development instrument, uh, we were able to see that children were coming into schools having less capacity around their social and emotional development. And we've seen an increase in diagnoses, uh, anxiety, uh, seeing some depression, um, more diagnoses with children who are on the autism spectrum, um, ADD, ADHD. And this is largely reported by schools and through that EDI who are recognizing that they in their teaching capacities need extra support with children uh, coming into that system. And we are seeing more concerning behaviors which has led to greater discussions around children's overall well-being uh, as well as their mental health. So we also know that we have partnered with some organizations, such as the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health, certainly um, Kids Brain Health Network uh, and, and Public Aid Health Agency of, of Canada. You know, we're starting to um, build that growing awareness and we're starting to partner with people who have this uh, similar understanding of how important these early years are. And so uh, a few years ago we had partnered with the Ontario Centre of Excellence to actually um, create a, a publication around supporting Ontario's youngest mind, really looking at the mental health of children under the age of six. So these documents are slowly coming out and demonstrating that there is this growing awareness and we're using this as provocation to really delve into infant mental health and how children are impacted by the people and the world around them and how we can come together to really encourage and promote optimal development in young children, absolutely. 
We're also seeing, um, you know, for example, we have set, we've partnered with Seneca, for example, to support uh, an infant and early child mental health certificate program. It's a one year program that offers more insight into the uh, mental health concerns and needs of children under the age of six. Uh, and my understanding is that there's about I think about four years of graduates at this point who are being able to take what they've learned in this certificate program and really embed it in their practice with families. Uh, I have taught in this program as well. And uh, a lot of the questions I get from the students are, you know, what can I do with this once I graduate? And it's kind of challenging because we, we still are playing with the role of infant mental health in the various sectors that we work with. And so is there an actual job for infant mental health? Not necessarily, but it's really about a perspective, about a lens. How do you engage with families and how are you embedding that into your practice, into your agencies, into the programs that you deliver? It's really about a mind shift about how we're, how we're working with, with children and their families. And I, you'll hear me say this all the time, it's children and their families. It's about that dyad, it's about that relationship. We're working with the dyad as well. It's the other you know, person or thing in the room with us when there's a child in a family who are, who are struggling and seeking supports. It's not separating the two, it's about the relationship and how are we supporting that to uh, increase outcome, better outcomes for children over their lifespan. So IMP had, again, a couple of years ago, had put together a compendium of existing Canadian public health messages on infant and early childhood mental health promotion. We did a national scan. And again, this is part of that growing awareness. We've actually found that in almost every province uh, and or territory, at least one type of messaging that was, that there was some type of messaging that was really promoting young children's well-being. And oftentimes it, it might have been around uh, some su substance use, um, but it was a, certainly a start in recognizing that children are impacted even before they're born uh, uh, by their environment uh, and, the, and the key players in their life. So this is definitely good ground to be working off of. We also saw some language changing. So established programs such as yourselves in those CAPC and CPMP programs, you're starting to use the language around infant mental health. Um, what we often hear from families, you know, is not that I'm concerned about my child's mental health, I'm concerned about their behavior and people starting to make the connection that behavior is a way for children to communicate what's going on and what they've experienced in their life. And so being able to start to use common language amongst the sectors and in programs such as yours uh, has really uh, elevated the awareness around infant and early mental health. We also know um, other programs such as the Ontario Association of Young Parent Agencies uh, also acknowledge that um, that not only were parents their clients but babies are also part of that and um, when i managed our the child care center that i worked at a few years ago i was a part of a um, organization that that had a residential program for young for young women uh, who were parenting pregnant and or parenting and what was so incredible to me is that the ministry at the time of ministry of social services didn't actually count babies as clients so when we counted beds, they were only the beds that were used by the young women. They're not the beds that are used by the children. And so when we would, you know, you, every year we go back to our budget uh, and we would say, you know, we actually have 20 clients, not just, you know, 12 who are young women. We have eight babies as well. We cater to those needs as well, but they're not seen. So we're, we, there's still a lot of work to do uh, in that realm to, for babies to be seen as people who need support as well. And then uh, we also, there's another program at Seneca uh, too, called the Bachelor of Child Development Program. And this is a four year degree where you can come out with an early childhood educator um, uh, eligibility for the college. And uh, it was a program that I graduated from. And in that program, we're starting to see more courses that are dedicated to early mental health, not just um, domains uh, or um, 
areas of development that are more tangible. Let's say, you know, your cognition, your communication. It wasn't just about those pieces. It was infusing the mental health pieces as well and really working on uh, promotion of overall optimal development. Sydney, any questions coming through? Hi, Nicole. Um, just one, just, just asking um, if your slides are going to be uh, available afterwards. We can make them available. Great. Thank you. I can include them. I'll, I'll include it with the archive then. Thanks, Nicole. Absolutely. Yeah, no other than that, you're good to go. Okay, great. So, all that being said, um, we had gone back to our competencies and started to really recognize that the growing needs and the growing awareness around infant and early mental health means that we have to come up with some kind of criteria or guideline of, of what is it that practitioners uh, in their various roles need in order to be successfully supporting children and families. So we went back to our competencies and we thought, you know what, we've got to review these. We've got to come to uh, more of a concrete plan. And so we had to start somewhere. And we started with the idea that we can't do this on our own. We need input from a variety of professions that work with children and families. We need input from a variety of sectors. And um, we were really lucky to have all of those represented um, at a working table. And we had established a committee that um, really was representative of um, those professions and those sectors, but also across the nation as well. Um, we met nearly monthly to kind of guide the development of this framework. Um, this was an enormous task. And there was an enormous amount of discussion um, among the committee members. You know, what were the most important things that we had to be thinking about? Uh, what pieces um, were, were meant for knowledge and what pieces were meant for skill um, and, and really trying to think, how do we come up with this, this drill down? So again, this was a process that, that has taken nearly three years to develop. Um, and so I just wanna give credence to the amount of work that has been done around this. We've met several times, lots of Zoom calls, some in-person calls, lots and lots and lots of discussion um, to try and come up with, you know, where do we even begin? How do we move forward? Um, and so, you know, we really had to, to think about where, what is the end game as well? We could start anywhere, we could end anywhere. There's, there's really no um, end in sight with how much we could put together. So these are just some pictures to illustrate and make visual uh, all of our thought processes because it would be quite a mess and many scribbles um, on a page if, uh, if we didn't use these ones. So we had looked at many models and this is the very famous sketch um, of my program director, Chaya Kulkarni, who on a Saturday morning woke up to a revelation of how she was going to uh, try and make this an actual model, an actual competency model. So this is the, the very beginnings of our competency framework and what that actually was going to look like. And so we've, we've called it the fan um, because it kind of fans out. Um, and these were her initial drawings um, and ideas of how we were going to get, organize all of this information. So once we had a sense of how we were going to use this model, we went to task. We had to organize all of the ideas and try to organize them in a way that made sense and was clear um, for not just practitioners, but certainly if we were moving towards how do we train, how do we inform, how do we deliver all of this information in a concrete uh, and clear way. So you can see that um, lots of sticky notes were harmed in the making of this model. And through that, we actually began to see the clearest components of that fan. So today, this is what the fan actually looks like. Um, we have at the bottom there foundations for infant and early childhood mental health practice. And then I kind of call these parts the pieces of the pie, um, promotion, prevention, early intervention, and treatment. And under each 
piece, so even in foundations, there are components that are specific to knowledge as well as skill. You know, it's one thing to know something from a theoretical perspective, it's quite another to embed that and apply that in your practice. And so we just want to look at the components here. It kind of mimics that Broffenbrenner model where you've got the child um, and certainly the relationship. We have the two figures here, adult and child, um, at the center of all of this work. Uh, and they're surrounded by their caregivers, the people who are most important in their life. They're surrounded by, you know, what's happening environmentally, what's happening from a cultural perspective, and certainly what's happening from a community perspective, um, and then surrounded by all of the skills and the knowledge of their, uh, of the resources, which are, you know, people like you. So this first component looks at those foundational pieces. And we really looked at these foundational pieces as no matter where you are in terms of your scope of practice in the pie, these are the components that every practitioner who is working with children needs to be aware of uh, in order to be able to be successful throughout the other components. And we'll, we'll dive into them more wholesomely in, in a moment. So, then we move over to that first promotional piece. And this is just looking at resources that are encouraging optimal early mental health. And that's a lot of the CAPC and CPNP programs. You're doing a lot of promotional work. You know, just because there isn't an issue yet doesn't mean that we can't do the work now to try and prevent that from happening or mitigate any things that we can't control from perhaps a developmental or biological piece. You're likely also working in some prevention measures as well. So maybe we know we're working with some families who are at risk. And again, that promotion and prevention work is happening to mitigate anything that may happen later on if we don't address some of the, um, you know, kind of issues that, are that, we're, that families are facing. The next is early in intervention. And this is where we begin the work of, all right, we might be seeing some concerns. We want to jump in. We want to intervene. We want to provide support and resources and be a resource. And what's the best way to do that? So what are the knowledge and skills that are associated with those who are working in that early intervention space? Come on. There we go. And then that last piece of the pie, treatment. And this is where concerns have absolutely been identified. Perhaps they're on the road to diagnosis or already have one. And now this is the work that's being done to um, alleviate uh, whatever's, whatever's been happening with that particular child and, and that family or even within a system. So it's really about that, the intensity of that. And, and as we move through the fan, um, we wanna be able to recognize that um, families can be in any and all parts of this fan. And I'll just go back to our fan. This is why we have the arrows. They're bi-directional because they're, they're meant to demonstrate that this isn't necessarily a sequ sequential process, but that families can go in and out and back and forth as often as they need to in order to get what they need to support their child's development. So you can absolutely be someone who's in treatment, but still demonstrating promotional pieces and prevention pieces. Um, and you could, you could absolutely be in any part of this pie. The family can be there, but so can you in terms of your scope of practice. The knowledge and skills piece are really just scaffolded um, from the knowledge and skill prior. So when we came together as a huge group um, to, to determine this, you know, this was already built on um, and was driven by the strong relationships we had with various sectors and professions. So it's just for us um, indicative of how important relationships are not just in our work, but certainly with the family and that diet, always coming back to that diet in the center um, as to why we do this work and why we need to do it well. Okay, so I'm just going to actually show you Okay. This is the actual drill down of all of those knowledge and skills pieces. So this is um, it's currently still in draft form, but we can we can watermark it and, and, and send it out Sydney along with the presentation if people are wanting to take a closer look 
at all of these components. So you can start to see like this is not no small feat. Um, we have our foundation and the knowledge and skills associated. So we have headings and subheadings. So for child development, these are all the knowledge components that you need to have around child development. These are all the skills you would need to have around child development and so on and so forth. We have brain development. We're looking at attachment and relationships. What do you need to know about community? Here's a big one, risk and protective factors, right? We have all of these components. Family-centered approach, trauma-informed care. This is um, something that has been um, kind of new-ish language in the infant and mental health world because we're really looking at the truth and reconciliation with our indigenous populations but also of our other minority populations our black uh, indigenous people of color um, you know they're coming into programs already um, with some some need um, just based on how they're generally perceived through service and so how can we support uh, that group accessing services and doing so in a way that's non-judgmental and that doesn't um, trigger um, past experiences. We can still support people without knowing the full background story. Of course, it's always helpful, but how else can we support um, all of the children and families without having to dive down and tell their stories over and over and over again? Other basic components around recognition of evidence-informed practices, Again, some cultural humility, recognizing that families are the experts of their children and we are there to be a student and to learn more and not to just give information. Uh, and some, some knowledge and skill around some advocacy. Um, oftentimes, um, I think we look at our role as, as nurturers and supporters, but we're also advocates. And sometimes I think we forget that. Uh, or that it's just it, it can be seen as as hard to do and advocacy doesn't have to be this big thing it can just start with uh, acknowledging and validating people's experiences and um, and and making some informed decisions about their care child factors socio-demographic and societal factors parent and caregiver attitudes and beliefs um, and and parents own histories uh, and how and how they were parented as well so foundation really covers a broad spectrum of pieces um, because it is the place we need to move from that informs all of the other knowledge and skills that come thereafter. So then we move into promotion, nurturing development, understanding some family engagement pieces, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary practice. How are we collaborating with others? Um, you know, we know that uh, children at this age their development is so interconnected to a variety of pieces that it's hard to just go through one door and get everything you need practitioners need to collaborate and work together to meet the needs of the whole child not just pieces of them prevention we have some supporting developmental vulnerability and understanding developmental profiles and then we move from trauma-informed care to trauma-informed practice and creating pathways to services and support. So how are we brokering uh, the other um, resources within a, a, a child and family's community to support their, their overall development? Early intervention. Now we're looking at some more theoretical applications. How are we learning and being a student with the child and the family? Partnering with parents and not in a tokenistic way, right? Really, truly partnering with families to ensure that we're all on the same page because we all have the same end game. How we get there might be a little bit different, but we need to have conversations about that so that we don't lose families um, based on uh, our own kind of bedside manner. Formulation and service planning, you know, how do we decide how to move forward? And lastly, treatment. For those of you who are in uh, the capacity or who have the capacity for assessment for formulation and for diagnosis who can actually practice those therapeutic approaches and services uh, and then very you know certainly last but not least planning what are the next steps for the family what is the ongoing service that's being provided so just to give you a sense, that's that drill down so you can see you know it looks nice and pretty now. Um, but it was really messy for the first two and a half years. Pull back. Oh. 
sorry, team, yeah, there we go. Okay. So now we have the framework in action. Um, how are we using it now? So this was finalized probably in the summer of that checklist was finalized in the summer of this uh, of this year around June, July 2020. Um, but we've actually start to put it to work to see what we can get out of this model. You know, how are we how are we using it? And so we have one project in particular called our infant and early mental health care pathways pilot project. And this is where we've teamed up with three communities in Ontario. Um, and approximately eight sectors in each of those communities to come to the table to talk about how do families navigate service when they need it? What doors do they go through? What challenges do they face? What are they hearing? Um, and are they getting the support they need before they age out um, and have to go and, and move to other services? Uh, what we're hearing from a lot of our families is that this is incredibly challenging to navigate. You know, in our world, we call it mental health, but in their world, they call it behavior. Again, so bringing, trying to bridge the gap in the language department it alone has been quite challenging, but even between sectors. Um, these meetings were absolutely profound in, our, in having us understand better what each sector is coming at with. Um, and it was really important for us to kind of get a sense of where do they think that their talents and skills and knowledge lie. So we took that checklist and we organized the sectors into tables. You know, education's here, early learning's here, child protection's here, so on and so forth. We gave them that checklist and we gave them on these massive sheets and we asked them to actually go through each and every single one of those bullets. There's 272 bullets in that checklist. And we asked them to go through them and say, do you feel you have strong knowledge and skill in this area? Limited knowledge and skill in this area? No knowledge and skill in this area. And it was quite amazing to see all of the reflection that was going through this process and really starting to unpack, you know, what is my scope of practice, but also, what is the scope of practice of the other people in my community? And if a child needs X, Y, Z, they might come through my door, but I may not be the best resource and that's fine. But now I'm aware of who is and I can direct them there. And so it's not necessarily always about making the right referral, but certainly making the better recommendation around who is in the best, in the best position to support you and your child's needs. So we were able to take that information and get some really beautiful data out of it. And you can start to see um, from a foundation lens that those in education, and I'll outline for you, the blue is the knowledge piece and the orange is the skill piece. And one is where they identified not so great knowledge. Uh, and three is where they dis they determined that they were quite competent. So we've, got, you know, let's look at education. Education, um, you know, we have a lot of amazing teachers out there, but most of their background is in something that is more subject related as opposed to child development. They're not so much learning about their audience. They're learning about the content they're supposed to be teaching. And so they're coming to the work um, not having a whole ton of understanding around the foundational pieces around child development, for example. Child welfare. Um, was another interesting group where they had lots of knowledge around social determinants of health, um, about uh, outcomes for children, but because they didn't necessarily do the work themselves, their skill was a little bit lower. They weren't actually uh, doing that work. And that's fine. This isn't to say that any sector was not smart enough for this work. We're not testing IQ. Uh, we're looking at what is the scope of your work. So again, let's go to early learning and childcare lots of knowledge um, in foundational work. They do a lot of uh, schooling and training around development. But when you look to skills, um, sometimes they're not operating based on that skill set. They're, 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 they've got that knowledge in child development, but perhaps they're not as knowledgeable in the other components of foundation that are around social determinants of health. They don't really use that language. They don't 
use that uh, information all that well. And then we've got some primary care as well. So lots of knowledge in the foundational pieces, um, but they're not doing the work themselves. So the skill is a little bit lower, just to give you a sense of how, how people are self-reporting. Some really interesting comments that came out of this workshop as well were, you know, so if we look at public health, for example, public health is sometimes made up of two basic core groups. We've got those who are in a more social work capacity and those who are in a nursing capacity. So you could say that you're from the public health sector, but your training and the work that you do um, may come have come from different um, paths. So your knowledge and your skills or your experiences were based on your placements, for example. You know, and then you can see where early learning and childcare, it's not within their scope of practice to do treatment. Um, so they're gonna have zero skill in this. That's not their scope and that's fine. Um, but that, but having been aware, being knowledgeable uh, about what's available in terms of treatment uh, is important given their, their work with, with families. So we then asked them to identify for themselves what were areas of strength that you found when you were doing this process. And so primary care was looking at, you know, we have knowledge uh, and we have in our work some integration of interpersonal practices, you know, being able to refer to different uh, organizations or professions. They were able to do that quite well. Education actually found it quite hard and quite difficult to come up with the strengths for this age group because they're not often working with that age group or they're not trained with that particular age group. Child welfare identified that they had strong theoretical knowledge. Public health was noting that they have that strong knowledge of social determinants of health and having a holistic um, wraparound perspective. And children's mental health said they knew of strong knowledge of, um, or they had that, that strong knowledge of family engagement and the importance of context. So you can start to see where you can say, you know what, I may not have this as a strength, but now I know who does in my, in my community and I can help families gain access to those people who might be able to be in a better position to support. Then we also asked them to identify some opportunities. So primary care was thinking, you know what, we might have to think more about the inclusion of social determinants of health. We may not, we may want to have a deeper knowledge of earlier stages of intervention instead of more uh, strongly um, associating with treatment. Um, how, uh, how they could engage with highly stressed parents and caregivers and that their knowledge was also dependent on placements. And so I want to be able to leave some time for some questions. So I won't go through them all, but we will provide you with this. And you can just start to see the breakdown of where some of these sectors were really having these light bulb aha moments of, you know what, we, we've got strengths, we've got things that we can work on or, or have that we can um, really um, lean on. But then we've also got these areas where, yeah, we might have to identify some gaps and how we can support that. So what's happening in these communities is that they have all decided that they do need more knowledge in infant mental health. And so we've embarked on a training um, series with all of them. So these three communities um, total close to about a thousand practitioners and we've created um, training cohorts for them. So in our first cohort, which will end in January, we're training about 250 practitioners all on infant mental health basics, so kind of the things you need to know, but we're also, uh, they also identified that within their communities they want a common tool. So we're training them on the ages and stages questionnaires, both the ASQ3 and the ASQ SE2, some of you may be familiar with that, and we're also training them with our developmental support plans that have been um, really the purpose to support children who are on wait lists and to make the most of wait times once um, a concern is identified and, and referrals have been made. We know that wait lists in the province and certainly across the nation can be quite lengthy. So what can we do now uh, within our own practice and raising capacity within individual practitioners to support the children and the families that they're working with? They also noted some surprises um, that they often, physicians uh, often don't feel 
that the promotion, the prevention, and some of the early intervention pieces are really a part of their job. You know, they're not looking for those things in the five or so minutes they have with when they meet with families. They're not looking for the right relationship. They're not looking for that dyad piece necessarily. Um, and they weren't, they're not so sure what to do from that perspective. They know who to send them off to in terms of treatment, but what can we do before then, before we have to get to that place? And so you can kind of, again, note that, that there were some surprises that came out of this as well. So moving forward, how are we going to be continuing to use this framework? So we've really committed to the idea that this framework is going to completely change how infant mental health promotion is going to organize and deliver our trainings and our workshops. The goal is that we're creating um, trainings that are going to be relevant and speak to each part of the pie. Um, so that our, we'll be able to identify that, you know, the training that you're in today is a really largely around uh, foundational knowledge as well as promotion and prevention. Those three often go together really nicely. And then we may offer trainings that are specific to early intervention uh, as well as treatment. And that's not to say that I'm the person to be teaching anyone about treatment. That's not my role, but we have networks of people who do provide treatment and we can invite them in to provide that information. It's certainly going to help us organize what resources we develop. Um, that's largely what we do is providing resources to practitioners such as yourself so that you are having uh, or feeling equipped with what you need to go out into the communities and work with those families. And certainly how we engage with different sectors and professions. This gives us a better sense of what we um, can expect to discuss with any given uh, sector or prof profession. And lastly, we are in the process of creating a learning hub uh, on our website. And this is where we hope to put all of those trainings and those um, resources. But we're also looking at providing a certificate program that will be recognized and accredited uh, in Canada so that we can have people who can call themselves infant mental health specialists, practitioners, experts, and the like, and have true training that can support this really vulnerable age group, but also an age group that you know, we miss so often in the literature. And so with that, um, that's uh, the basic presentation. I hope that it has been informative. I hope you've had an opportunity to really reflect on your own experiences and your own training and what you bring to your role and to the families that you work with. And I certainly invite any questions or comments or thoughts um, from all of you. Nicole, hi. <laughs> My goodness. Um, thank you so much. I, I guess just sitting here, uh, I am, uh, what really strikes me is just the breadth and the depth of all, <laughs> all of this work. And I just want to offer an initial um, uh, you know, a moment of gratitude to you to sort of taking us through that that journey, and um, I, I do have a, a couple of questions that that have popped up here. Um, so the first one is: um, Are peer educators and frontline staff part of those trained through that pilot? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So what we've, what I can expand on that is we've identified that through, so how we started this project is we had reached out to community leaders um, and, and they said, you know what, or actually they came to us asking, you know, we want to do what's called a, a community table and we've done some of this work before where we come in um, and the, the community leaders are saying, listen, we really want to organize what do we have mm -hmm. in our arsenal, in our community, what do we have already and what do we need uh, in terms of, like, we have to identify some gaps, what do we need, what can we improve upon, what, what can we do in, in regards to supporting families. And so we've had these initial conversations with leaders um, and it's, it's snowballed into, okay, so now at the leadership level as a community, we have committed to learning more about this age group and what we can do to support them. It's just not knowledge. We're finding through our research that you give people knowledge and that's fantastic, but what you need to do is give them the how-to. What's next? Here are the actual tools and the way to do it. 
Um, and so we've embarked on this massive pathways project that is firstly identifying what do you have in your community? What are your strengths and what are your areas of opportunity? And we've used the competency model to address that. Mm -hmm. And now you have identified that you want more training and whatnot. So we've um, been able to create two streams of training. One is for leaders in the community. So all your managers, your supervisors, people that may not actually be working directly with families, but they're supervising those that do. And it's important that they're in the know just as much as our frontline practitioners. And our stream two is made up of our um, frontline mm -hmm. uh, practitioners who are actually doing the work. So in this cohort from September to January, we are um, training upwards of 250 frontline practitioners on mm -hmm. base on ASQs and on developmental support plans so they can hit the ground running to support the families that they're engaged with. We have another cohort from January to April and then another one from May to next September and uh, we're hoping to continue to get funding for that project so we can we can do this uh, more in those communities but certainly uh, be able to take on other communities. Oh, awesome. Okay, yeah. I have a couple more questions queuing up here if you've still got time. Of course. Um, uh, uh, Nicole, how are um, Indigenous teachings or an Indigenous lens um, reflected or embedded in the trainings, would you say, or, or do, do you have that? Um, we, so this is certainly a commitment that AMP continues to work on. We, um, we, we have an Elders Council. Um, that we have been working with who are supporting our, our new, our, our learning and how we can embed um, traditions and beliefs and, um, and perspectives mm -hmm. into how we get people to work with families. We do have another project called our Nurturing the Seed project, which is right. looking at our, our developmental support plans and how they support Indigenous populations in particular. So we've partnered with seven sites across the nation um, to gain those perspectives and to find um, ways that are more meaningful for our Indigenous partners um, to gain access to services for their kids. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing thing, absolutely. Sure, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, would you say, or what would you um, consider in terms of best practices, especially thinking of us as CAPC and CPNP uh, projects, uh, to pr promoting competency framework within an organization to get buy-in. I'm not sure. I hope I'm expressing this. Oh, no, I, I think like, how do we get the up top people to make this policy procedure and just our philosophy right? Uh, in right. how you deliver your programs and your services? Um, I mean, well, one is take our training, <laughs> I think is right. is because we really try to impress upon like what I think people don't always get when it comes to infant mental health is we don't have to wait till there's a problem. Uh -huh. You know, we can do this promotional work from the get-go. And if it's a part of uh, our philosophy and a part of our practice from the get-go, then it trickles down into all those pieces. And I know that sounds, you know, rather vague for the, for the question being asked, but it, it really is about, you know, where is your leadership at in their understanding? of infant mental health and where's your leadership at in terms of what are the the outcomes and the mandates that CAPC and CPMP programs have and how how you can actually use the competency framework to get there. The hope is that this model will become a bit of a checklist of how people um, look at um, who they're bringing in to run these programs. Mm -hmm. um, how how can you use that uh, part as your uh, as a part of your orientation or your hiring packages? Mm -hmm. um, that's the eventual goal, I think, further down the line. What I'm curious, Nicole, is um, like I think of the comments you made earlier about how we don't think of sort of infants and babies as our as our clients, and mm -hmm. even um, you know thinking of broadly us as a society thinking of babies as as beings with mental mental health. And um, do you have any advice for us as CAPC and CPNP staff in terms of maybe sort of bringing that awareness to families? Um, I don't know, does that make sense? I guess, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Oh God, we we need a whole other workshops in here. Do we? Okay, we need a part two. Yeah, we need a part two. Hey, I'll, I will. Uh, <laughs> You'll hit me up for that. I'll shamelessly uh, ask you to do that. <laughs> of course. Um, I think it really is about. Um, so I'll, I'll reference our developmental support plans. For example, they. When we put together a developmental support plan, we come up with children's strengths, we come up with a goal, we come up with a number of strategies and then benefits. Why is this important? Mm -hmm. But they're all in the child's voice. It's about communicating uh, um, the importance of attunement and trying to think about how your baby's thinking. And right. we can speak to families about where their child is at from in terms of a brain development perspective. Like if you're able to sit with a family and really communicate um, the importance that who they are and how they respond to their child is going to be the building blocks of that child's brain development. Relationships drive development mm. um, and good positive responses to your child's cues and recognizing that your child isn't crying to annoy you. Right. Um, you know, they're not right. trying to manipulate you, right. but they're clever and they're resourceful and their cries mean something. And so when behavior is seen as communication mm. and the expression of certain behaviors tells us potentially what's happened in that child's life and what their experiences have been, mm -hmm. you know, we start to see another child. And I, I, you know, I have this little phrase that I've used throughout my career, you know, when you change a connection seeking, um, uh, or sorry, when you see, when you look at a child and you see them as attention seeking, you know, change it to connection seeking. Right. You see a different kid, right. you know, about how many times they're trying to connect with you because you are so important and recognizing the influence that families have on their child's development, you know, positive and less positive um, is going to build the, the road is, is it's a roadmap of what their lifespan trajectory is about um, so noting their importance but also noting you know they, they're they're the biggest game changers this kid has mm -hmm. um, and so when they see the, themselves in that light mm -hmm. then perhaps we can get them a little bit more on board with these early years count um, more than any other time frame in a in a person's life yeah Oh, thanks for that, Nicole. I have a, a, another question here. Yeah. Um, again, thinking about your comp the competency framework mm -hmm. and um, any advice you might have or recommendations as a first step for us if we're you know, working in a CAPC or CPNP project and we're wanting to um, engage with the, with the framework and, and improve sort of or begin to build on our, those knowledge and skills. Do you have a, a recommendation as a first step? Um, I think it would be to really um, sit down and sh and with the checklist mm -hmm. and reflect on where are your true knowledge and skills pieces. And again, I go back to this isn't a test. It's not, um, you know, whether someone's capable or smart or it has nothing to do with that. Right. It's recognizing where you are at in your practice. Right. What are the beliefs and attitudes that you bring to the table? Um, and do you need to enhance some of those? Do you need to pull back on some of those? Mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, what are the tactics and strategies you use in your practice that have been so successful? And right. try to think of why. Are they because you're um, engaging in meaningful conversation with families? Uh, is it because um, you are uh, really thinking about the whole child? Um, are you talking to parents um, as if they are the expert of their child? Um, so really, you know, we can certainly provide the checklist along with this presentation mm -hmm. and sit down and really reflect and do for yourself that little activity. What am I really strong in? And what are things I know I need to work on? And then try and find those opportunities to, to bridge the gap in where you think you might need a bit more uh, experience and, and be okay with being uncomfortable with it. It's, it's how we grow. Um, and, and this is certainly an iterative process for us. So as more information and more science comes in, the more training and, and the more competencies will add to this list. Mm -hmm. um, and, and us as humans need to do the same. We're always evolving, the content's always evolving. So if you keep moving with it, you won't get left behind. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, you, uh, you know, you mentioned before engage with the training that's being offered out of your um, um, out of your organization. And uh, I know that we have had access here uh, yes. in our network, which has been awesome. 
and I know the access to the first um, sort of a series is, is now gone, but there is the, the second series. Yes. And, um, I don't know, uh, I don't want to put Blanca on the spot, but <laughs> maybe she might be willing to, to join us here. I, Blanca, and maybe share a little bit about how people might be able to access, or we could certainly include that information uh, when we share mm -hmm. the, um, the, the recording mm -hmm. uh, of, of the session. Sure, Sydney. Thank you. And thank you, Nicole. That was amazing. Um, I know that it's been a long, <laughs> long journey. I had been a part of uh, some of the discussions, but certainly not to the extent of um, some people who actually represent CAP CCPMP projects from across the province. And, um, uh, you know, they definitely had amazing input from the CAP CCPMP perspective but also within their own sectors and disciplines. So that was an amazing experience. Um, so in terms of the access to some of the infant mental health promotion training, we had been you know, really lucky to have for the last few years access to all the webinars. And actually it was through CAPSI CPMP that we first piloted with infant mental health promotion, the very first uh, infant mental health webinars back in 2012, 2013. So mm -hmm. those webinars really started with CAPC CPMP, which is kind of neat. Yep. Um, and we've been able to, you know, have the resources to offer those at no cost, unlimited access for the last few years since 2013, basically. Um, and um, fortunately for the foundations training that was just launched in January by IMP, um, we didn't have uh, funding for this year, but uh, Chaya being who she is graciously yes. um, after the pandemic very Probably like the following week after the pandemic. I was on the phone with Chaya uh, Many people were accessing the infant mental health 28 2018 2019 webinars at that time they came in really useful to people that were working from home and I was speaking to Chaya about it and she offered the foundations training. So uh, we've had access to that training. Um, CAPC CPMPs in Ontario is not open to, to other CAPC CPMPs, only those of us in Ontario. So um, the foundations training, I think it's, it's an amazing 13 sessions. And um, some of those, I think the bulk of those are available in French as well. Yes. And, you know, I would, continue to encourage people to access those. We've sent the link uh, to the zones. I don't know how much those um, have been shared. The link to register, you do have to pre-register for them, but we can do that again. Sydney, mm -hmm. I, mean, I can mm -hmm. send you that link again and, and sure. we can yeah. definitely. I think that those are a great way to, you know, like there's a first session that is Infant Mental Health 101. Mm -hmm. And then it just proceeds on different experts talking about their expertise on different topics. But I don't know, Nicole, do you have any suggestions how to, how to get the most out of those training, how to make the link between that training and this um, competency framework? Uh, I think, I mean, the, the lectures, so the lecture series, which you're talking about, Blanca, we have so many like series, so I try and discern between them all. Um, so the lecture series where there was the 13 sessions from a variety of experts in the field touching on, on again, a variety of topics in the field. I think that it's, it's really about where you're at um, in, in your, your training and certainly your roles. And you'll start to see uh, which ones are really um, important to you. I mean, one of my favorite ones, I mean, they're all my favorite, but one of my favorite <laughs> ones is one by, one by Nora Spinks. When she talks, she's from the Vanier Institute of the Family in Ottawa. She talks a lot about her engage, like engagement with families. And I think that's the starting point. Start there and recognize where your relationship is with families and how you build relationship with families and how you're delivering uh, programs. So having that lens is really important to, to uh, providing the best service possible. Um, and then I think that we've also got, Blanca, we have our IMP Basics, which is separate from the lecture series, um, which is pre-recorded. It's on our website. It is free. Uh, you do get a certificate out of it. Um, and, and it does go, uh, it does do that deeper dive into, into infant mental health in particular. And you can start to see 
the nuances of, of relationship of epigenetics. This is a big piece. We talk about, um, you know, epigenetics as how um, the, the experiences of the generations before us impact the generations ahead and, and we you know I talk about for our indigenous population uh, they call it blood memory and I like that term so much better because it makes much more sense to me but it's about how the you know your genetics in your blood remembers um, from generations past and how it's carried forward and so this work that you do is not just working with a child and their family your work impacts generations to come and that is the profound impact of the work that you do. And so really recognizing that when you start from the beginning, the, the work that you're doing isn't just session by session um, or program by program. Uh, it, is, it is for years to come. So being really intentional, being really mindful of those interactions and that engagement. Um, and so certainly if you're in a position where you want to be learning more about the ages and stages about how to do developmental screens so that you can provide support right from the get-go instead of waiting for more intensive services, um, you know, the other trainings that we have are around that developmental support plan, which, um, which are easily put together. You know, we've, we, you basically copy and paste from a, a kit into a template and you've provided a very tailored um, set of strategies for a family to, to begin the work, which is always relational and always dyadic. Um, and, and no harm can come from trying to improve relationship. Mm, I think that's, that's I, I, I like um, I like that and I think that's a, a good place to end because I'm seeing that we are at four minutes after 11 and first of all Blanca thank you for being willing to pop on and highlighting those resources and thanks Blanca. for your continued advocacy for uh, learning and awareness um, in this area of infant mental health and um, thanks to everybody for joining us today. It was really great to have you all here who were able to come uh, live for our session and we will be sharing um, a video, the video recording. Nicole is willing to share her slides and we will be putting together this list of uh, continued learning resources and we'll highlight all of that in an upcoming newsletter. And uh, finally, another um, offering of gratitude to our presenter today. Uh, Nicole to be it's been just great to have you here um, and and thank you for uh, you know sharing this uh, really I think um, uh, um, amazing framework and it's just been amazing like I said to hear about sort of the breadth and depth of, of uh, research and reflection and uh, study and engagement that's gone into producing this tool that I know will be helpful to us in the work we're doing with families. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you for the invitation and I can only really take credit for standing here and talking to you all today. But the, the real thanks goes to um, the, the number of people who have uh, committed their time and their effort and their knowledge and their skill and their passion and dedication to infant mental health uh, on this framework. Blanca included. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. She's an enormous uh, advocate. Um, for this population and an and advocate for for you guys uh, in your programs and so you know I hope you all have an opportunity to thank her as well but again to all of you who are on today you're doing the real work you're doing the work of infant mental health mm -hmm. um, and so I I commend you I applaud you uh, I thank you for that work because you are the ones making the difference in the lives of children and families um, and they're they're all better for it so thank you for your work Wonderful. Yeah. And, um, and just a, a reminder, I did put a, a little link to uh, an evaluation survey. It's just a short little five minute um, survey for you to share um, your thoughts on today's offering and, and how we can continue to uh, improve and uh, offer sessions that are meaningful and relevant to you as you do your work. One last thing I wanted to, to say, actually, in terms of uh, mental health, a reminder that our network is hosting a mental health learning circle on uh, November 24th. Uh, so watch the, the newsletter for information on that. And um, yeah, with that, um, goodbye. And let's all enjoy this, uh, this bonus of a sunny weekend that uh, many of us have been given in Ontario. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. It was my thank pleasure. You. That was great.
Okay, good. Good. So good to see you, Blanc. Yeah, you too. Nice to see you, Nicole. Thank you.